Welcome to the meticulous review of the 2017-2018 Unified Indoor Bocce Coaches Resource Guide. Um, please take time to listen to the information, read the information, and any questions that you have concerning information that is covered in the guide or during this review, you can direct towards your district representative um, and whatever answers that they may need help with, they can direct towards myself, Brian Montgomery, Chair of Indoor Bocce, or Melissa Kelly of Special Olympics, and we'll be sure uh, to relay necessary information back to you. So in this guide, you will see a season timeline that shows you important dates. Uh, we'll do a detailed review of the rules and the play of bocce, how bocce should be officiated, how it should be scored, um, the uniform requirements, player assessments, postseason registration forms. Toward the end of the guide, you'll have supplements of all the forms that you need, the application for participation, the affirmation of eligibility form, and then you'll find information on getting the Class A clearance, which is what is required of all non-student athletes who will be participating in any form or fashion, whether that's coaching or being a dedicated aide. And then you'll also find contact information for Special Olympics Maryland staff and district representatives, and then a map of all of our districts in Maryland. So without further ado, I just want to jump right into it. The first date to make note of is Wednesday, November 15th. This is the date set by the MPSSAA for winter sports to begin, which for you means that this is the first day that you can hold practice, i.e. training for your bocce team. So no training or practices should take place prior to this date. Tuesday, December the 5th is the first eligible play date. So this is the very first day that you can compete in a bocce match against another school. So uh, your schedule should not include any dates of competition against other schools that are prior to December 5th. Friday, December 15th, this is the day that Special Olympic forms are due for your team. So that includes the applications for participation, which is the individual form that each student athlete is required to have completed and submitted, and then each school will have an affirmation of eligibility form, which affirms that the student athletes who are on the roster have met all the requirements by MPSSAA, local school districts, schools individually, and Special Olympics in order to participate. Monday, December 18th, this is the day that team assessment scores may be administered. So uh, you cannot do assessment scores before this date. The idea is we want the student athletes to have a few weeks of training before assessment scores are administered. So again, December 18th is the first day that the window opens for team assessment scores to be administered. Um, Tuesday, January 9th is the due date for the post-season registrations. Um, and please make note that these are dates that Special Olympics are requiring the district reps to have the forms in. So your district rep may provide you with a different date. The point is uh, these dates um, could be different based off of what your district representative communicates to you. However, whatever due date that you're given, please adhere to them. It is very important without paperwork being submitted in a timely fashion. Um, teams and or student athletes may be deemed ineligible for postseason play. So again, uh, two big dates that you want to remember is Friday, December 15th. That's the day that the applications for participation and affirmation of eligibility are due. And then Tuesday, January 9th, is the day that postseason registrations are due. January 20th through February 3rd is the window that district tournaments will be hosted. So each district 
uh, could very well be held on a different date in terms of their tournament um, that will be set by the local school system and your district representative. We will communicate that to you. Um, the state pre-competition webinar for those schools who will be advancing. Uh, here's the webinar link for you to sign up for. The date and time will be announced. And then the actual state championship is Tuesday, February 13th, 2017, with the inclement weather date of February 15th. And in the event of inclement weather, notifications will be sent out in a timely fashion. And the makeup day again will be February 15th. Um, please make note that teams should compete in the season for a minimum of eight weeks with teams practicing at least twice a week and participating in at least uh, three competitions during the season. You can participate in more, but the minimum participation uh, for actual matches against other schools is three. And if your team is unable to meet this expectation, you can contact Melissa Kelly at the email provider, mkelly at somd.org. On to the rules and overview of the indoor bocce program. So the court size, standard court size for indoor bocce is 60 feet in length, 12 feet in width. As you can see, uh, the lines that are closest to the end board are marked um, from the end board, and these are your foul lines. So those are 10 feet from the end board. And then the next set of lines, which are the dash lines, are foul lines for any student athletes who may be using a ramp. And then you have the mid line, that purple line that's denoted there, which basically demarks the middle of the court. So there's a diagram of your standard court. The official ball for indoor bocce this year is the, uh, the Bubba Bocce Jail Field Balls. So um, it's a little bit bigger than the standard size. The grip is, or the makeup of the ball is so that the grip is a comfortable grip for all student athletes kind of form fitting to the hands and to the fingers and makes for a comfortable grip and therefore release for all student athletes. Um, any event that uh, the jail leaks out of the ball, um, it is a non-toxic substance on the inside. It's easily cleaned up with soap and water and can easy, easily and safely be disposed of. Roster and lineup composition. So Every unified bocce team has to have a minimum of four players and a maximum of eight players. For teams that meet the maximum of eight players, they can be designated to have two additional players to act as substitutes. Those two additional players must be uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of um, a student athlete with a disability and student athlete without a disability. So again, the minimum that you can have on your bocce team is four, and there can be a maximum of eight. For teams that have the maximum of eight, two student athletes in addition to that can be designated as substitutes, one being a student athlete with a disability and one being a student athlete without a disability. At least 50% of the roster should be players with intellectual or some other type of disability and then the remaining players should be student athletes that have no disability. To a foster a true inclusive environment, uh, there must be a minimum of two student athletes with disabilities and two without disability on every team. And just um, a note, per school, there can be multiple teams. So um, one school can have one or more teams. Each of those teams must meet the requirements of the roster that are covered here. Um, Another note, a team must use a minimum of four players 
for each match as well. So if a team does not meet that minimum of four for each match, then they will, uh, of course, forfeit the match. In the in each frame, um, the team lineup must consist of one of the two following options. Option one, two players with disabilities and two players without disability. Again, option one is you can have a ratio of two to two. That is two players that do not have a disability and two players that do have a disability. Option two is a three to one ratio of three players with disabilities and one player without a disability. So you will not be allowed to have um, any lineup during any one particular frame where there are four players with disabilities or four players without disabilities, nor could you have three players without a disability and one player with a disability. It must follow option one, option two. And just to be clear again, option one is two players with disabilities and two players without a disability, or option two, which is three players with disabilities and one player without a disability. A note here in blue, each player of like role, whether that's athlete, which is defined as a person with an intellectual disability, unified partner dash IEP 504, which is a student athlete that has a disability other than an intellectual disability, or unified partner, um, aka partner, which is a person that does not have any disability whatsoever. Each of these roles shall have equal throwing opportunities during each match. And what that means is you can't have any player of any given role um, rolling any bocce balls a disproportionate amount of times than another player of a different role. So um, in essence, everyone should get an equal amount of throwing opportunities during each match. For teams that have the maximum of eight players, the way the coach will set each frame up is to have four players on one end of the, of the court, four players on the opposite end of the court, and during one frame, the first four players roll, during the next frame, the second set of four players roll. In the event that a team has less than eight players, and even that a team has less than eight players, then student athletes will have to rotate in order to make four for that particular frame. And we have an example to spell out what we're saying. So if you look here, frame one, okay, frame one consists of players A, B, C, D starting on one end of the court and they're going to roll the first frame. Players E and F who are on the same team as A, B, C, D during frame one will be at the opposite end of the court. So during any one particular frame, four is the maximum amount of student athletes you're to have at one end of the court. So again, E and F um, make up the rest of this team. So in this particular example, this team has a total of six players. So during frame one, A, B, C, D, each roll a bocce ball. The score is taken, and then before frame two begins, two players, in this case it's A and B, rotate to the opposite end to join E and F to fulfill the four player um, requirement to start frame two. So now C and D are at the opposite end, uh, waiting for frame three, three to begin while A, B, E, and F are rolling frame two. Looking at frame three, now players E and F rotate to join C and D to meet the four player requirement. If you notice, going back to frame one, 
players A and B did not rotate down to frame two and then rotate back up to frame three. And this is what we were saying that each athlete, each student athlete gets a equal amount of throwing opportunities. So rotating in this format keeps the throwing opportunities equal amongst, amongst each student athlete. Okay, now to go a little bit deeper into how substitutions work. To reiterate, for rosters of eight players, up to two additional players, one with a disability and one without a disability, can be designated as substitutes. And what we encourage is that while substitute, substitutions can be made in critical times of the game, the essence of the allowance of substitutions um, is to extend participation opportunities to players and provide relief to schools that did not have sufficient students to sponsor multiple teams. So again, a school can have multiple teams, but in the event that they are not able to field enough student athletes to field multiple teams, um, substitutions have been granted. So again, the, the uh, intent is to extend the participation opportunities for players. And uh, here you'll see the parameters that are applied for substitutions. So the players with the lowest or best assessment scores shall roll in the first frame. And this is to um, put in a precaution for coaches to disguise a ringer who could be entered in at a later time to gain a competitive uh, advantage. So on your postseason registration form, which we'll get to later, that will have all of your student athletes' assessment scores. The lowest scores are, quote unquote, uh, the best scores or for your best will be designated to your best players. So what we're saying for this first parameter is if you have John Doe who has uh, the lowest assessment score and you have a roster of eight with two substitutions, then John Doe has to roll in your first frame as to prevent him from being substituted at a later time as um, a ringer, if you will. Um, another note on substitutes. You cannot designate anybody as a substitute on a roster that has less than eight players. For example, if a roster had, uh, let's just say, six players on it. So this roster, for this example, has six players on it. On it. A coach cannot put four people in the initial lineup and then designate the remaining two players as substitutes. Any roster that's less than eight people, every student athlete on that roster must play the entire game. Substitutes are only designated for teams that have the maximum of eight roster spots filled. Another parameter, substitutes must occur um, for students of like role. And what that means is of your two substitutes, of course, again, one student athlete will have a disability and one will be without a disability. Um, when when those subs come in, the sub the the student athletes, the teammates that are coming out must be of like role. So if I'm coming in and I have a disability and I'm a sub, the person who I'm coming in for who is now coming out of the game, they uh, should have a disability too. You cannot substitute a partner for an athlete or vice versa. Substitutes can only occur at the end of a frame. So once a frame has be begun, a substitute cannot occur until the end of that frame until all eight bocce balls have been rolled out. Um, only one substitute per roll per team 
per match. One substitute per row, per team, per match. So what that means is once you substitute an athlete for an athlete, then there can be no more substitution of that athlete for the remainder of the game. And, of course, the same thing goes for the partner. Once you substitute a partner for a partner, then no more substitutions for a partner can be made. Once a player is substituted, then they cannot re-enter the match unless it's in the event of an emergency, and it has to be approved by the competition manager who's in charge at that time. Now, in the case of a tournament, in the, in the case of a tournament, uh, during different matches, the substitutions don't have to um, occur at the same time nor with the same student athletes. So, for example, if during match number one of a district tournament, um, Kelly, who has a disability, subs in for Mike, who has a disability, um, when that same team plays again, if Kelly is designated as a sub, she's not required to come into the game for Mike. She can come in for another player if that's the coach's decision, as long as that player is of like role as Kelly. Um, and what we encourage is for coaches to make substitutions um, for, you know, uniform and meaningful involvement halfway through the match, whether that is um, when eight points are scored since matches go to 16 or just during the 15-minute mark of a 30-minute match. So either by way of points or by way of time, um, we encourage that substitutions be made halfway through the match. However, at your discretion, if you want to make them at a different time, you are allowed to do so. Just keep in mind that once the substitutions are made, that role can't be substituted anymore. The standard length of match for indoor bocce is 30 minutes or whichever team reaches <coughs> excuse me, 16 points first. So, of course, a clock is set. If uh, a team reaches 16 points before the expiration of that clock, then that team is declared the winner. If the time expires before a team, any team reaches 16 points, then of course whichever team has the most points at the conclusion of the time um, is declared the winner. Um, based on your district representative or host coaches, these times could be modified as you can say. As you can see, the 30 minutes is recommended. It's pretty standard. Uh, in the event that you do have to modify time, we ask that you don't make a match less than 20 minutes. We want to give the student athletes at least 20 minutes to play um, each, each match. Dual matches. So you have one school facing off against another school and no other schools are involved. Um, a standard format that's that's often used is for those two teams to play a best two out of three game series with one another to declare an overall winner for a dual match. On to the sequence of play. So, to begin the game of bocce, <clears throat> we start with the coin flip, and whoever wins the coin flip decides which color balls their team will use. There's one set of four green bocce balls, and then there's another set of four red bocce balls. The balls are tossed in an underhand delivery, okay, underhand delivery, but the grip can be um, overhand or underhand, but the delivery itself must be an underhand delivery for every frame. Each player must stand behind the foul line when delivering his or her bocce ball or the polina. So, again, you see in the diagram that first red solid line, that's the foul line. Um, if a student athlete is, is not using a ramp, then he or she must be behind 
that foul line. In the case that a student athlete is using a ramp, then they have the whole area of the end board up to the dashed line, which is the foul line for apparatus usage. Um, and whichever one pertains to that student athlete, the solid foul line or the dashed foul line, um, they cannot cross during the delivery of the Polina or the bocce ball. So again, a coin flip determines uh, who goes first and who uh, uses which ball. The winning team of the coin flip selects the color of the ball. <clears throat> and to begin, a player has to place the Polina. So the Polina is a small white or yellow ball, sometimes it's white, sometimes it's yellow, small white or yellow ball. They have to place that in the field of play. Um, and the team that is placing the Polina has three attempts to roll or toss the Polina. The Polina, in order to be a um, eligible ball, it must go past the mid-court line and stop before the opposite foul line. Again, a successful placement of the Polina means that the Polina goes past the mid-court line. So you see the, the blue mid-court line there. It's past the mid-court line, but it cannot go beyond the opposite foul line. So if you look at the diagram, um, you see the athlete rolling the Polina from the left end of the court towards the right end. In order for that Polina to be good, it must be in that shaded yellow area, which goes past the midline, but it stops short of the foul line. In the event that a Polina is not placed successfully on the first attempt, that same team gets two additional for a total of three attempts until the Polina is placed successfully. Now, please note that um, the team is composed of multiple players. Therefore, various players or multiple players may attempt to place the Polina during the three attempts. So Kelly, Mike, and Don are all on the same team. Kelly attempts to place the Polina and doesn't place it successfully, depending on you know, the coach and what the coach's strategy is or at the coach's discretion, she can have another opportunity to place the Polina or if the coach elects, a different player can come in and place the Polina from the same team. The team itself gets a total of three attempts, but it doesn't matter which of the players take those attempts. The only requirement is at the point that any of the players successfully places the Polina, then that player must roll the first bocce ball. Again, any player that successfully places the Polina in field of play, that player must roll the first bocce ball. Um, if the initial placement of the Polina is less than 12 inches from the sideboards, then the official will come in and place the Polina 12 inches from the sideboards and play will continue. And I'm sorry, let me back up. So in those three attempts, if that team is unsuccessful, if that team is unsuccessful in three attempts and placing the Polina, then someone from the opposite team comes in and attempts to place the Polina. If that person from the opposite team places the Polina successfully, they are to leave the court and the team who was originally set to roll first, they still roll the first bocce ball. So in other words, under no circumstances does a team who has the advantage of rolling the first ball lose that advantage. So three, three attempts to place the Polina, 
If they fail, somebody else from the opposite team can come and place the Polina. If that, if the opposite team places the Polina successfully, it's still the team who was designated to roll, roll first. It's still their turn to roll out the actual first bocce ball. Now, in the event that after the three attempts by one team and not to be one attempt by the opposite team are all unsuccessful, then what the official will do is the official will just come in and take the bocce ball, I'm sorry, the polina itself and place it in the middle of the opposite foul line. So three attempts by one team, one attempt by the other team, if all four are unsuccessful, then the official places the Polina in the center of the opposite end foul line. Now, going back to the initial placement of the Polina. So if the Polina is in the shaded area, but it is less than 12 inches from the sideboard, then the official will move the Polina away from the sideboard so, there, so that there is a 12-inch separation between the Polina and the sideboard. Now, once bocce balls are rolled, if a bocce ball hits a Polina or hits the Polina and the Polina ends up less than 12 inches against the sideboard, then that's fine. It just cannot be placed there on its initial placement. So it stays there and play continues. If the Polina, for whatever reason, <clears throat> excuse me, ever comes closer to the person or to where the student athletes are rolling from, so it comes in this picture to the left of the mid court during this frame, then that frame is considered dead and a new frame is begun. So if any type of um, any crazy bounces happen or ricochets and the Polina ends up on the closer side of the mid court line, then that frame is considered dead and a new frame is to begin. No points are awarded. No player is to roll a Polina or another ball, of course, until the preceding balls have come to a complete rest. So when a ball is in motion, a player cannot jump onto the court and roll his ball. All balls must be at a complete rest before a player can roll his or her ball. <clears throat> so going on to the sequence of play. So after the first team rolls the first bocce ball, it's automatically the opposing team's turn to roll. So let's say the team that's rolling first has the green balls, the Polina is rolled, the first green ball is rolled. It is now the team who's rolling the red ball's turn to roll. After the second ball is delivered, the team that goes next is determined by the proximity of the bocce balls to the actual polina. So whatever team has their ball closest to the polina leaves the court and allows the other team to roll. The best way to remember and to officiate and coach this sequence of play is using the term, terminology, green is closer, red rolls. Again, green is closer, red rolls. What that means is that the closest ball to the Polina is a green ball. Therefore, it is the red team's turn to roll. Again, green is closer, red rolls mean that means that whatever, that means that a green ball is closest to the Polina, so it's now the red team's turn to roll. And this sequence is continued until all four bocce balls from each team for a total of eight is rolled. The official will determine points 
which we'll go into in the next section. Once the official determines the point, then all players walk to the opposite end if need be, and the next frame is started. The team that is awarded the points during the frame is who will be presented to roll the Polina and to roll the first bocce ball during the following frame. Scoring. So after both teams have rolled all four of their balls, the frame is complete and the official must enter the court or observe the court to decide which team is awarded points and how many points that team will be rewarded. During the conclusion of each frame, that means only one team receives points. Again, only one team will receive points at the conclusion of each frame. The points will range from one to four. So one team is awarded points, and those points can be as little as one and as many as four. The way it works is one point is awarded for each bocce ball of the same color that is closer to the Polina than the closest ball of the opposing team's color. And of course, we have a diagram here to illustrate what we mean. <clears throat> so in this diagram, if you see the Polina is in the center there, the two red balls are closest to the Polina than the closest green ball. So to the top right of that circle, you see the closest green ball. However, the red team has two balls that are closer to that Polina than that green ball. So in this example, the red team will be awarded two points because there are two red balls closer than any one green ball. Of course, if one of those red balls that are closest to the Polina here were further away and uh, further out than that green ball that's closest to the Polina, then the red team would only get one point. Let's say all four of those red balls were sitting inside of that circle with all green balls being as illustrated. All four red balls sitting inside of that circle would mean that the red team would get four points. So you can see how um, only one team will be awarded points and the number of points will be determined by the number of balls that are closest to the Polina than any than the closest ball of the other team. Excuse me. So in terms of what qualifies as a legal throw, players are permitted to roll the ball or toss the ball in an underhand delivery, preferably using one hand. And we define an underhand delivery as releasing the ball below the waist. So you can see in the two pictures um, on the left, the student athlete is standing up and his release point is where the dash line is. Players are allowed to take a knee and roll the ball with their release point still being at their waist. And this is a matter of safety, so that rule is implemented as a safety precaution and to maximize ball control. Any ball that's released above the waist will be considered a foul ball. Again, any ball that's released above the waist will be considered a foul ball. Players with any type of physical or anatomical challenges will be permitted leniency on this rule um, of underhand throwing and in the event that is necessary, will be permitted to deliver the bocce ball in an overhead method. This is something that should be discussed amongst coaches and with the tournament director before the start of the match. The, com the penalty for a player committing um, a foul is to declare that specific bocce ball dead. So what happens is if a ball is released and a foul is committed, so a ball is released above the waist and a foul is committed, then the referee or the official, if possible, will seek to enter the court 
and stop the motion of that ball that was a foul ball before it interferes with any other ball, stop it and just remove it from the from the court so that it's no longer in contention and then it's the next person's turn to roll. In the event that an official cannot safely enter the court and stop the ball, then that official after the ball is rolled would then go in and remove the ball and if that ball affected the position of any other ball, including the Polina, Polina, to the best of her or his ability, that official will reposition the balls to their original locations. So again, if a ball or if a foul is committed, if possible, the official will stop the ball, remove it from the court. If the official cannot safely do that, then after the ball is rolled, she or he will remove it from the court and if that foul ball interfered or affected the position of any other bocce balls or the polina, then uh, a repositioning of those balls will take place. A player can grip the ball, again, by placing his hand over the ball or under the ball. So to the left, you have um, an underhand grip, and then to the right, you have an overhand or an inverted grip and uh, it's still an underhand delivery but some student athletes prefer one over the other. Either way that still must require that student athlete to not release the ball above the waist. So here's a diagram of the foul line so players must have at least one foot in the court of play, and the foremost part of the foul line cannot be surpassed by any part of the player's foot. So each student athlete, when they're rolling, bocce ball or polina, they must be completely behind the foul line. Of course, they cannot surpass the line, but their, neither of their feet can come into contact with the line. In any case that that happens, they pass the line or their foot comes into contact with the line, then that particular ball is considered dead. And again, the official will attempt to stop that ball and, uh, and remove it from contention. In terms of uh, students who may use ramps or wheelchairs or crutches, the same rules apply. So for that dash line that's extended for the use of ramps, no part of the ramp should extend beyond that line or touch that line. If the foremost part of the apparatus, so a ramp or whatever is being used, um, is not in contact with the ground, does not touch the floor, then it cannot break the vertical plane of the foul line. So the inv invisible imaginary vertical plane that exists um, from the floor going up, the apparatus cannot break that plane either. <clears throat> Again, no player may play his or her her ball until a polina or another ball has come to a complete rest. In the event that that's hap that happens, that's also considered a foul ball. Same uh, official procedures apply. It is perfectly legal for teams to hit the sideboards and the inboards with their bocce balls. These are considered to be legal throws. If the polina at any time is hit out of court, then the frame is declared dead. So that's uh, a second way based on where the polina is that a frame itself, the entire frame is considered dead. If the polina somehow bounces outside of the court, then that entire frame is considered dead. Um, the players and the balls are brought to the opposite end of the court and a new frame is started by the players that are positioned at the opposite end of the court. 
if a bocce ball, so one of the green or one of the red bocce ball, bocce balls, um, exits the court during any any row, um, any ball during any row exits the court, then that ball itself is considered a dead ball and is removed from play for the remainder of that particular frame. So again, if a Polina exits the court, then that entire frame is considered dead. However, if a bocce ball, red or green bocce ball, exits the court, then just that particular ball is considered dead and play continues for that frame. Proper measurement procedures. So in the event that at the conclusion of a frame or to determine who is to roll next, that a measurement needs to take in needs to be taken place. So to the naked eye, it cannot or it is not um, easily determined which ball is closer. Then a measurement an official will take a measurement to see which ball is closer. In the event of a measurement, the proper procedure is to take the end of the measurement tape, place it at the center side of the bocce ball that's in question in terms of being distance, the bocce ball, and then run the measurement tape through the top of the polina, the top center of the polina, and take the measurement from there. So again, any time that a measurement needs to take place, the measuring tape is placed at the center side of the bocce ball and run, is ran through the top of the polina in order to get the measurements. In terms of ramps, um, there are many different styles of ramps that are used for bocce. The one rule is that uh, the ramp must allow for the player to make contact, so push or touch his or her bocce ball on their own. So no device or apparatus can be used that actually propels or pushes or hits the bocce ball itself. A ramp must be used that allows for the player to make contact and push or touch the bocce ball itself. on to coaching and instructional assistance. So once a player enters the court to deliver a ball, Polina or bocce ball, once a player enters a court, enters the court to deliver bocce ball, no coaching or instructional assistance may be provided by any coach or any teammate. And this is very important because many times uh, reality is coaches uh, can fall uh, victim to this, if, uh, lack of better words, and forget and not give instruction. But also it's important to tell your student athletes who um, are, you know, acting in, in good character by coaching, but once their teammate enters the court, no coaching or instruction can be provided by a coach or by the teammate. In, the, in that event also, a player cannot step into the court and then step back out of the court to receive instruction. Once he or she enters the court, then they must, must proceed to rolling a bocce ball. Um, there is an exception. So for players for their respective disability and disability level that need additional assistant, assistance, then uh, a coach or a teammate can provide verbal cues from inside the, inside the court, but it cannot be um, instructions on where to roll the ball. For instance, if you have someone who has a visual disability and may not be able to see the polina, um, a teammate or a coach can stand inside the court behind the polina or next to polina, and they can use um, the terminology, I am standing beside the polina, or I am standing in the back of the polina back of the polina and leave it at that. They cannot say, um, roll it to the left hard. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and anybody, of course, who needs additional coaching support, that should be discussed, again, 
amongst coaches and amongst the tournament director or host, host coach, host school before competition actually starts. In terms of accessing the court, only one player at a time may access the court. So all non-players are required to remain in what's called the coaching box, which you can see here. Um, the one exception is if a student needs help with entering the court or um, physical balance. So, of course, in that case, a student athlete or a coach may have to lift up one of the end courts for somebody who's in a wheelchair to enter the court or someone who uh, needs help setting up a ramp or someone who needs help with physical balance. In any event, uh, no coaching still is to be provided, but um, that exception is in place for those particular situations. And of course, for good sportsmanship, we're asking that at the conclusion of each match, teams come together and shake hands. As you know, Unified Sports is all about uh, meaningful involvement, which is one of the seven criteria for a successful Unified Sports program. And with Unified Meaningful involvement means is that every student athlete is giving an opportunity opportunity to contribute to, to, to the success of his or her team through their unique skills and qualities. Again, every student athlete or every player is given an opportunity to contribute to, to the success of his or her team through their unique skills and qualities. Few indicators of Meaningful involvement being in place. Um, teammates are competing without risk of injury to themselves or, or others. Um, teammates are participating according to the rules. Um, meaningful involvement is not achieved when, and these are basically red flags, um, you have a particular teammate or teammates displaying su superior skills without involving their teammates or you have student athletes who are acting predominantly as um, on court or on field coaches as opposed to being a true teammate or a mentor controlling most aspects of the game. So basically being overbearing, being dominant um, or not training with the team, only showing up for game day. So just be sure that you have a program in place that's promoting meaningful involvement. Here's a sample, sample score sheet for you to use during your match. It's very simple. You have the frames listed. There are space, there are space left for additional frames. So of course, one team will be red, one team will be green on the other side, and you only tally the side of the team who scored. So this particular sheet will keep track of how many points were scored each frame and also, which is very important, which team scored those points each frame. <clears throat> Here are the uniform requirements. So uniform bocce, um, the uniform requirements, each student athlete must be in a uniform in order to compete and participate, and the uniform should have one of uh, the unified sports logos that, excuse me, are in the peel lozenge, um, not one that's outside of it, as you can see. And it can be a T-shirt, it can be a polo shirt, um, as long as it just has the proper logo and team, team name on it. What we want to make special note of is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, proper uh, bottoms. So bottoms can be shorts, athletic shorts, skirts, or athletic pants. This also can include khakis. Um, what is not permitted is jeans of any color, and that includes uh, jean skirts, jean shorts, um, and then, of course, regular jeans of any color 
are not permitted. So again, in terms of <clears throat> excuse me, bottoms, it must be shorts, skirts, or athletic pants, i.e. sweatpants. Proper footwear is required, so no boots, no slippers, or open toe shoes to include um slides or flip flops are to be worn. Um have your students wear athletic shoes so they'll they'll be able to participate. Headgear, no hats. Rimless headwear or bandanas are allowed. Religious and medical related headwear is permissible. Of course, just make sure it's clear at the beginning of each competition with the tournament director. While no hats are required, headbands can be worn, but they must be of a solid color and no wider than two inches in width. Um, a piece of material can be folded, tied around the head to use as a headband as long as it um, meets the requirement of not being wider than two inches. Penalties for uniform. So if a uniform violation is caught before a match starts, then that player will not be able to participate until he or she is able to fit themselves in the proper uniform. If a match has begun and a uniform violation is noted, then an automatic penalty will be assessed to the player and the team, which is to be immediately removed from competition until the uniform requirement can be complied with. Anytime a shirt is removed um, while in the competition area, that should lead to an automatically automatic disqualification of the tournament. So player assessments. Um, player assessments, again, can begin on Monday, December 18th. And player assessments are what we use to division and rank teams at district tournaments and the state tournament. So it's very important that you complete these and get them in by the due date. So player assessments, um, they actually go, I'll scroll down a little bit. On this form here, the postseason registration form, and the way a player assessment is conducted is the Polina is placed at the 30-foot line, which is the midpoint line, and a player rolls eight total bocce balls. The coach only measures the three closest bocce balls and records them on the post-registration sheet. Then that same player uh, rolls another eight bocce balls, but this time the Polina is placed at the 40-foot line. And again, the coach only records the best three scores. And then lastly, the Polina is placed at the 50-foot line. And a player, the same player again, rolls all eight bocce balls. And the coach measures and records the best three scores. Please place measurements in inches only. Again, please place measurements measure measurements, excuse me, in inches only. Here, excuse me for it being sideways, here is where um you can see that for the thirty and forty and fifty foot measurements you have the um space to write the three best scores on this postseason postseason registration sheet. This is our fact sheet for the state tournament. Um, again, it's February 13th with the rain date of February 15th. There will be a total of 32 teams competing in this tournament, and that will be determined by district tournaments. So based on the number of total teams in each district that are participating, each district will be allotted a certain amount of teams to advance to the state tournament. For example, if District 1 is allotted um, 
four teams to advance to the tournament than when District 1 holds, I'm sorry, to the state tournament, when District 1 holds their district tournament, um, four divisions may be set up in the top four finalists or the four gold medal winners of the district tournament would advance to the state tournament. So the teams that will be advancing to the state tournament will be determined and announced at a later time. But mark your calendars for for the event of your team advancing. It is February 13th at Hagerstown Community College. Um, schools should arrive between 9 and 10, so make sure you're in contact with your athletic directors and uh, supervisor of athletics to have the buses in place for that. Here's the application for participation form that each student athlete is to use, so please distribute these as quick as possible. Make sure they're completely filled out. Vet them to make sure they're accurate and complete before submitting them to your regional sports director or your district representative. Here is the affirmation of eligibility form. So um, the previous form, this is one form per student. This form is one form per school. Even if the school has multiple teams, you can just use a running, a running form. This affirms, again, that every student athlete that's on your roster has met the requirements that are put forth in order to participate. So this is turned in with the application for participation, and every student who's on this list should have one of these forms on file completed as well. Um, here you will find a frequently asked question for what's called the Class A Volunteer Clearance Form. So all non-student athletes who are participating in any fashion must have a Special Olympics Class A clearance. Um, the forms are included on this in this resource guide. And as you can see here, there are uh, two easy steps to complete the Class A status slash verification. First of which is to fill out this form, which again is one of the supplements to this resource guide. Complete this form for any persons under the age of 18. So you may have a student um, who is a manager for the team or is coming along as a buddy but not actually participating. In addition to this first form, they have to fill out the student minor reference form where they get two non-family members to fill out this reference form to submit with their, with their Class A application. And then the second step is to complete the short quiz that's found at this link. Any questions with Class A clearance should be directed to your regional sports director, um, of which you'll see a contact list in a minute as we scroll down. But any questions you have about that can be directed to your district representative or your regional sports director. And make sure these are filled out in a timely fashion, I would say by district tournaments they need to be filled out or your clearance status for the state tournament could be in jeopardy. Here's a contact list of all of the district representatives representing each district that is participating in indoor bocce, followed by Special Olympics Maryland staff. So these are your regional sports director, and you can see which districts and or counties that they are over. Then at the bottom, we have Melissa Kelly, who is the senior director for school sports programs, and myself, Brian Montgomery, chair for Unified Bocce. District map with the asterisk denoting all of the schools that will part be participating in indoor bocce, and then you have each of the supplement forms for you to print out and use and distribute as needed. Note on the annual polar bear plunge, which is taking place on Thursday, January 25th, 2018. You can sign up at coolschoolsmd.com. Sounds of fun. That concludes 
this review of the resource coaches guide. Of course, if I missed anything, if anything wasn't clear, first let me apologize. Second, please reach out to your district representatives. They should be able to clarify if they're not, they know that they can contact myself for anything that needs to be clarified, anything that needs to be expounded upon. Thank you for taking time to view this webinar briefing, and uh, I hope you have a very fun, exciting, and successful season.